Good day, Don. Hey, first of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Guys, it's a privilege to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, you and I have never met before face-to-face -face or virtually oh. a few moments ago. And um, we, I, we just discovered a, about a month and a half ago or two months ago that we weren't even on LinkedIn together. And somehow I discovered that. Uh, but we, I've been following you on Twitter, and I've been watching videos of you. And uh, but anyway, so it was kind of a kind of interesting. But I've been intrigued about uh, the things that you're up to over there on the other side of the pond. I guess is the way to put it. And uh, so I was interested in, in in doing this video with you, which is all about human performance technology or human performance improvement, but just how we might use learning and development and other means to the ends of performance improvement of people in the workplace in particular. Yeah. So I'd like to start off with uh, an introduction of you through a series of questions that I have. So it's kind of a four part introduction, if you will. But so for our audience, let's start with where did you grow up? I grew up in a town called Guildford, which is a notoriously dull suburban uh, city about 30 miles to the south of London. Uh, it's, it's known as a dormitory town in the sense that um, traditionally the men would work there and commute up to London to work and then come back again to sleep and then go back up to work again. I think it, things are a, a little more sophisticated. It's not just the men now. Um, unfortunately, it's the women as well having to make the same trip. Uh, I grew up there and I think I lived the first 20 odd years of my life, 21 years of my life there and then went on to a series of places, ending up here in London, where I've lived for the past 26 years. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about this. So where did you go to school and what did you study? When you say go to school, what do you mean? Because there's in the US and University. UK. Okay, right. So um, I went to Oxford University and I studied politics, philosophy and economics. But I kind of, um, I've always felt slightly uneasy about the magnificent reputation Oxford University has. It is a good university, but I think sometimes the reputation rather uh, is in excess of what's warranted. And I, I, I sometimes uh, feel it would be nice to have a conversation with somebody who could just say, well, I, I go to Oxford University and nobody bats an eyelid rather than saying, oh, that's, that's quite impressive. And I, I remember as a young man, when I was 20, I traveled around Africa by myself a bit in uh, going from Egypt down to uh, Sudan and then down to Kenya and uh, around the, the small stakes of Rwanda, Burundi and so on. I was in Sudan, right in the middle of Sudan, in, in a, just waiting for a lorry by the side of the road. It's, it's the means of transport. And I was 20 and an old chap was selling tea there. Very nice. Fire by the roadside, brewing up the tea and they make very, very strong, very sweet tea in Sudan. I was looking forward to it to slake my thirst. And he said to me, so while well, he was waiting, what, what do you do? I said, I'm a student. Oh, so where do you study? And I thought, well, finally, finally. I mean, I'm probably as far from the sea as you can get in the middle of this enormous landmass. This guy, I'm going to be able to say to him, I'm going to Oxford University, and he's not going to bat an eyelid. I said, well, I, I'm going to go to Oxford University. Oxford University, the Mahdi's grandson went to Oxford University. It seems that you cannot escape this reputation anywhere in the world. But anyway, that's where I went to. I'm not sure that politics, philosophy and economics had anything really to do with my work, except that I have found that I've used each of those, strangely enough, pretty much every year in my working life since. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. So after university, what did you go do? Uh, and eventually, I guess, we'll get to how you fell into learning and development. But, but how did you start off uh, right out of college? Well, actually, I started work before I went to university. I, I, uh, in the UK, there's a thing called taking a year off. It's now called taking a gap year. I took two of those. I worked for a year and I traveled for a year. Traveled in Africa, as I've just said. I, I worked for a year as a computer programmer. So I, so I left university, didn't know what I wanted to do. I wrote to all the local companies with the word computer in their title. I ended up getting a job for a year as a computer programmer. I wasn't very good. I was okay. Um, I realized it was something that was going to be very important in the future, but that I should probably focus on something else other than programming. I left university, 
I didn't really want to stay in the UK. I wanted to see a bit of the world. And I, after a couple of things, went and studied teaching English as a foreign language. So I quite consciously went straight into this business of training and have more or less stayed there since. I, I went into it. I did a, a bit of work in the UK, first in London, then near Oxford. And then I went off to, well, I had a choice. In those days, you, you did a course. You went to a basement of a building on Piccadilly. And there was a pin board. Was, the World Wide Web didn't exist. There was a pin board of places that you could choose from. And I could go to China. I could go to the States. I could go to South America. But Turkey caught my eye. I knew it was a place where people were very friendly and like lots of places in the world. But I thought, I don't want to go to the States because I'll end up going there anyway. I'd love to go to Africa, but I will never really fit in as a, I'll always be something of an outsider. But in Turkey, well, I think I can go there. I know the people are friendly. Let's try it. And I stayed there for five years. And I was always teaching while I was there, first year full-time, after that part-time, doing other things. So right from the get-go of my post-university career, I was involved in people learning. And where did you go from there? I got to the point in Turkey where I realized I couldn't progress what I was doing anymore. I uh, came back to the UK and I'd, I'd done a variety of things. I programmed computers. I had run a sales department in Turkey. I'd taught myself and learned pretty good Turkish. I'd printed magazines I, myself. I had um, worked for in, in sales. I'd worked in marketing. I'd been a trainer. Uh, and I thought, well, what on earth does this really lend me towards? I'd like to carry on doing something in the training field, but it seems a very flat career progression. I don't know what to do. I came back to the UK. I did a few bits and bobs. Then I found myself looking at this advert in the paper that said, are you reasonably good at everything? And I thought, that describes me. I've done all these things. They're, they're going to want me. Went up there, um, did my interview, did a trial presentation, got a job in a startup company teaching software, Microsoft software for end users. Um, I think I was the 24th employee, Oxford Computer Training, as it was. And that company went on to grow and grow. By the end of the, the decade, by the last working day of 1999, I was the sales and marketing director. I was the um, guy who ran the largest center, which was in London, which had a $12 million turnover. And it had been a, a process of about nine years of really intensive learning about the business of running a training center and how people think about learning. So it was, uh, I'd already been you know, in the world of training and learning up to that point, but that was a really intensive uh, introduction to that and stood me in good stead. That gets me up to the end of the millennium. Let's, let's go forward. I uh, left because I wanted to do a startup. It was the dot-com boom. I thought, win or lose, it, I cannot turn to my grandchildren. And they say, what did you do, granddad, in the, in the great dot-com era and say I sat on my behind? So I went out and I started up a company, which was, I sold within a couple of years, nothing grand, but it, it did the job and it helped me understand a lot about startups, a lot about our field again. And I went straight from there into doing another startup, helping uh, some guys who just set, set up something in talent management. That was another eight years. By this point, I'd already been chairing the Learning Technologies Conference, which I started doing in 2000 when I started working for myself. And I did that, but well, I still do that now. I chaired the learning and, well, it was the, Institute of IT Training, which became the Learning and Performance Institute in, in 2010. I chaired that from 2010 to 2021. And I, all the way along during those two, those two roles, I started doing a lot more writing, a lot more thinking, a lot more research uh, into what happens in our field, which really took shape in the Global Sentiment Survey, which I started in 2013, 14 and has just celebrated its ninth edition. And that brings us pretty much up to date, except for one extra thing I'm doing now. I'm no longer uh, formally involved with the Institute, though I continue to support it, but I am, uh, I am involved with Emerge Education, which, which is a startup VC fund for edtech startups in Europe, uh, looking to help them grow successfully and to help deal with this issue about supporting people in their learning in the workplace. Thank you for all of that. That's very, very <laughs> interesting. Um, so, Guy, I've got to say, I've got to say, 
I, I loathe talking about myself in much detail because it's such a boring thing. You know, it's like when somebody says to you, tell me about yourself at a party, you want to be able to get through it in 20 words because everybody wants to hear it. But I, I guess that, you know, you put a bit of emphasis on this because it's important for your listeners. Please feel free to cut as much of that out in the edit as you want. I don't do any editing like that. So just a fair warning for you. Um, but for our audience, you know, how did you get to where you are today? Well, this is this is the journey that you've taken. And yeah. it's not a straight path, as we kind of talked about before we started recording. But uh, so I think that this is this can be helpful to people because I, I don't want them to think that they can just, you know, plan it all out uh, to the nth degree mm -hmm. and then execute mm -hmm. on that plan. And voila, they'll be there at the end. Uh, but I have a couple of questions about some of the things you just mentioned. But before we go there. Tell me about the globe, the world globe uh, over your shoulder here. Uh, this one here. What's that all about? The globe is, it says on it, uh, the Times Globe from 1963. And my mother had four children. I was the fourth one. My I'm afraid I was, I was a rather traumatic birth. And after I was born, the doctor made it quite clear she couldn't have any more children. So... She took all her maternity clothes, went down to town, sold them, and with the proceeds went and bought this globe. So it's the year of my birth. It's the world as it was then. And as I was growing up, it was just around the house. And I would look at it. I was thinking about the places I'd go to. What was it like there? What would it be like to, to visit the very north of Siberia? Uh, how hot would it be in the tropics? And these things were, they weren't abstract ideas somehow the globe made them very real for me and so i've kept the globe since uh, if, by the way it's slightly battered it doesn't turn properly but i can make it turn and so this evening i'm doing a webinar to colleagues in new zealand talking about the results of the global sentiment survey i spin the globe around so that they can see their country on there actually i might have to turn a little bit more uh, so, and and feel that they are being somehow subliminally welcomed but it's a really good reminder, this globe, of how things that appeared permanent once are transient. It's peppered with places, some of which I visited, Sudan, Yugoslavia, which just don't exist as countries anymore. And it makes me think, well, what else that we grew up thinking is permanent is going to change in the future? I think it's a as well as being, for me, a beautiful reminder of many, many great thoughts in my youth, it's also a salutary reminder of the transience of, of all human ideas. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so you, or just a few moments ago, you talked about the conference that you've been involved yeah. with. And t tell our audience a little bit about the conference, how long it's been going on, what the, what the purpose is, who the audience is, etc. So the... The Learning Technologies Conference runs in London, but it's part of a set of conferences that take place now in the US, France, um, Germany, a couple in Germany, and, and possibly elsewhere will be added to that in the future. Learning Technologies in London continues to be the, a, a conference and exhibition uh, that runs over two days, and it's been running since 2000, and its purpose is to help people understand what's happening in the world of learning technology. It's very straightforward. The exhibition is huge and the conference probably has about 800 people come to it. And it's our job over two days. It's my job to create a program which helps people be exposed to new stuff and have a chance to converse and talk about it and network with colleagues so they can really start fixing in their minds and make sense of it. Because we know that the, 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 the input of new information is only part of it. It's the discussing with other people and the great connections you can build that's also a crucial part of making sense of, well, the new environment that we're in with learning technologies. And I, I, you know, a lot of people say, oh, Don, I'm not sure, should I speak at learning technologies or should I attend? I, I'm not really a technical person. Well, the technical side of it is probably about, I don't know, half, of it the rest of it is really about learning and uh, how we can help people learn i always always try to use the word help or support because that's what we do you can't make people learn but you can help and support them in the process exactly, exactly. tell us a little bit about the, the sentiment uh, survey that you uh, are having. yeah it's not embarrassing really guy i just dreamt the thing up in a pub in colleague in conversation with a couple of colleagues um, and I put it on my blog the next day and it got a bit of traction. And the first three probably were just, you know, getting used to the idea, building some thoughts up.
But I could see that once you got to three years of data, even though, strictly speaking, I probably couldn't compare year three with year one for lots of reasons, it was still pretty interesting watching trends change. And so I started calling it not just that thing I do on my blog, but the Global Sentiment Survey. I started publishing a report around it. I started getting sponsors for it and talking about it. And I probably do about 20 talks a year just based on that content. And it's not the main thing I do, but it is a fascinating view for me of how the world's thinking. It's, it's a deliberately short survey. I ask one obligatory question, what will be hot in workplace learning and development next year? And I give people a choice of 15 things, they choose three things from it. So what all this means is that there is a, a chance to do the whole thing, if you're a native English speaker in particular, probably in a minute. In fact, about half of people do do it in a minute or less. Um, there are two more optional questions. One is where do you work? And about 80% of people answer that, so a uh, multiple choice. And then finally, what's your biggest challenge for the coming year? Now. The response to that is very interesting. 40% of people answered it this year. And it's a real privilege to see what, what's going on in people's minds. It's also very interesting that actually, whereas the, the answers to the first question, what do you think is going to be hot next year, vary a great deal, the issues that people face really tend to be the same pretty much worldwide. And it's, it's kind of sad when you just read these people talking about the tough things they've got to do. But that is the question, so they're answering it. And as I say, it's a privilege to get that glimpse into people's minds as to what's, what's going to be in their minds this year as they try to, try to help people learn at work. i um, been doing it for nine years now. Next year will be the 10th year. We're going to, going to expand it a few, in a few ways next year. Not the questions, but in many other ways. We're going to give more support to sponsors, provide a lot more data around the, what the results mean. And one big change I make next year is shifting from it being entirely anonymous. It will still be anonymous to do it, but I want to build a cadre of people so that I know that it's the same people voting in a series of locations so that I can really compare like with like each year. So the same 100 people in Chile voted for this last year, but this year they're voting for that. What changed and why? Rather than it being possibly down to sampling errors and so on. So what started as a very simple thing, a simple idea has become quite a rich set of data and something that I'm looking to try to make as, as valuable as possible for everyone who, who accesses the data. Well, I will include in the show notes to the YouTube video uh, a link to get uh, to download the, the, the report that you did, because I just looked at it a couple of weeks ago, I think, um, or last week, uh, getting ready for this interview. But what are your big takeaways? What's, what's hot today? And what What's the prevalent, most prevalent challenge that people are facing today? So what's hot today is reskilling and upskilling. It's the same as it was last year. And the reason for that is I think that people are keen, two things, people are keen to get something done which will help the organization move forward and they're being asked to do it as well. There's no question that there are genuine large swathes of programs taking place to reskill and upskill people. But it's also the case that I think people are looking for something to hang their hat on. They want to be able to say, this is what I'm doing. In a world where learning and development is in a state of flux. And I say that not because I'm, well, it is speculation, and one always has to be wary of that. But I, thinking about it, what, I'm, what I saw when I published the initial results on LinkedIn was something quite strange. Normally, I would post this and I'd get 20,000 views. Fine, it was nice. I posted this. Within a week, I had 100,000 views. So why were the views five times as large this year as they were last year? My speculation is that people were looking for something as we emerge from COVID, and let's hope we are emerging from COVID, to give us some sense of a route map, a guide to what's going on in the future. So that sense of certainty, I think people latch on to it and they want to say, oh, right, so this data, look, it's 3,500 people from 112 countries, Probably this is telling us something about the world. It, it is. Uh, unfortunately, it's also possible to extrapolate uh, things that don't actually bear uh, the foundations of the report, but that's another matter. Uh, so I think, I think two reasons for that, then, why reskilling and upskilling is so hot. One, genuinely things are happening. Secondly, people are looking to pin what they do on something which they know everyone's talking about at the moment. So that's what's hot at the moment. 
Your second part of your question was, well, what are the difficulties people are facing? Uh, I put those answers, it was about 1,400 answers to that question, what, what are your problems, into 16 categories, of which five were the, accounted for about two thirds of all the answers. And of those five, the one that was the, the biggest single bucket was engagement. It's about 17% of people saying that it was just difficult, more difficult than it's been in the past, to get people to take learning seriously, to find time to learn, and in particular to learn online. And the phrase that kept coming up again was weariness, fatigue, Zoom fatigue, screen fatigue. There were lots of quotes around the idea that people are just tired and that's in two senses first they're tired of working online and so they're tired of doing anything online but they're also tired of having to learn online they want to do more stuff face to face that was a that was a very strong theme that came through it doesn't mean that we're going back to where we were in january 2020 that's never going to happen but it does mean that people are seeking either new ways of making sure that people feel excited about learning or that there will be some of thing of a shift back to face to face Thank you. Thank you. Again, I think it would be very interesting for people to follow up and uh, to check out your report. I think it was very intriguing. Let Thank me you. Here's a little bit. And uh, uh, you, uh, what can you share with us about your first exposure to what I call human performance technology? Others call human performance improvement, but it's really all about improving performance in the workplace through learning and other means. But what was your first exposure? to this whole notion of not just tr uh, training or learning in an educational mode, but in an enterprise mode where we're really trying to affect uh, terminal performance back on the job? Well, this is a really good question. I spent quite a lot of time thinking about it because you shared these questions beforehand. And given that I have spent my life pretty much in this field of training people, uh, and of technology, and of learning, it is pretty awful that in my early years, I could not think of a single moment when I was exposed to not training, not learning, but some form of technology that was there to support people while they were learning. And in fact, I honestly think that the first time I could remember it, and this is a, this is a very weak example, the first time I can remember any form of support, human performance technology, whatever you call it, is probably the help function built into Microsoft Office, as it wasn't called them, but Microsoft Office products, some point around 1995. Now, that's a pretty terrible indictment, because by then I would have been 32. Um, how did I get from where I was to then without having more exposure to this? Well, I, I, maybe it didn't exist, or maybe it wasn't that prevalent, or perhaps I was in some other place from where it was. But, Guy, is that normal for people who are chatting with you on these interviews? Well, uh, to some extent, it depends on kind of where they grew up in the uh, <laughs> profession. And how uh, old they are. Well, uh, yeah, so if, if I came from uh, the National Society for Performance Improvement here in, in the state, mm -hmm. North America in particular, with with some people coming from Asia and from, from Europe to a, attend conferences over the years, but I was I joined it in, in 1979. And there were people there that were promoting, you know, we don't want to just do learning or instruction. We want to impact performance. And how do we go about doing that? Through and and one of their big discoveries was there's so many more variables here that we can do stellar instruction and not impact performance on the job because there's other variables. And, and so some people grew up in that. Other people came out of a quality movement, total quality management movement, um, influenced a lot of people. They're all trying to improve performance through various means. And they always bump into that human variable, which has caused some to then explore, you know, how do they help people, you know, perform in processes or what we nowadays call workflow. Um, so that, yeah, there's, there's quite a huge variance of this. And so I think one of the things I've learned, this is about my 150 something video, uh, talking with people about their journeys into the, 
that kind of an orientation, um, and it, it varies tremendously. Um, and there's no one route that that people ha- have taken. But but so let's so who were some of your early influences in the the kinds of things that you were doing from a from a training or an education or learning perspective that have had major impact to you. I want you to share this so that our audience might mm. pick up on some of the people or articles or books that were important to you early on that influenced you in your, in your early development. I think I, I, I don't want to underestimate the value that I got out of spending one month learning how to teach English as a foreign language. Now, it's not the only thing which I did in this field, and it's not the only thing which I've read or whatever, but the practice of consciously trying to help somebody else learn, and the technique that I was taught in is a very common one, which is that you do everything in English wherever you are in the world. So I was in Turkey with a bunch of people, typically beginners who spoke no English, and you would teach them how to speak English from scratch, speak English. And the techniques of doing that, it cannot be instruction because (laughs) they literally don't understand your language. So you have to start by functionally getting to a point whereby they have got enough English in order to have some form of communication. And that's very different from learning how to instruct people. It's, it's, It's totally, coming back to that point, about helping people learn how to learn this language. And because people typically don't know how to learn. So you're teaching them not just the language, you're teaching them how to learn the language. There's quite a lot going on there. So for me, it was the very practical business of turning up at International House on Piccadilly. And I still remember how excited I was every morning to get up and get the tube and get to Green Park and walk down and go and learn this stuff and go and do it. It was was so much more exciting than going to university had been. And from day one, literally from the first day, you stand up and you do something to instruct other people. And you end up a rookie, but with some really good instructional techniques under your belt. And it was, for me, all about two things, paying attention to the detail. So am I going to spend five minutes on this or seven minutes on this? It was about making sure that what you did was clear so that you were not confusing the people you're working with. So you were focused on being efficient, you were clear, and all the way along you were working underneath a sort of umbrella of structure where you were trying to say, well, we're going to get people from here to here on these series of steps, and I know what's coming up, and Everything I do to build here will help them here or here at some point in the future. So it wasn't a series of disconnected events. It was rather a conscious building of people's ability. Um, And I think those things apply. That was a classroom setting. But those things apply whatever you're doing to support people in learning. It doesn't even have to be involving instruction at all, really. But I want to just, I've got a series of books in front of me on the desk here, Guy. I want to just also bear in mind that I come from a background of a bunch of people who who taught one way or another. My mother was, amongst other things, a teacher and an educational psychologist. And my my grandparents on my father's side were uh, teachers and their parents were teachers. And I've got a long book here from the the, um, school that Arthur Smith, my great-grandfather, uh, was in charge of in the middle of England, a place called Brackley. And this is from uh, February 1906. The infants are in very good order, and the methods employed in their instruction are satisfactory, but greater thoroughness seems to be necessary in the number and reading lessons to render them more effective. What I found extraordinary about this book is that you can pull things out of it from the seasons and how kids were hating going to school, how they'd they'd bunk off to do this, that, and the other. But some things, which which seem 
very strange today, but something's really resonate like that. This idea that, ah, you know what? All the time we're focusing on trying to be as effective as possible in our delivery. Um, and I think that's also, when you, your question is what influenced me uh, in my youth? Well, I think it was that actual business of physically instructing people and really getting that feel. I'm in a relationship with this person. How am I supporting them? But I also believe that unconsciously in the background, there's stuff that comes from books like this and other, other things growing up involved with the whole process of thinking about how we learn that probably I wasn't conscious of, but which informed me as in my development as a young man. I hope that's you. not too long an answer. Again, it's, no. it's the bloke at the party talking about himself at great length. <laughs> I'm sorry to put you in such an uncomfortable position, but uh, you'll have to deal with it. Um, so let me shift gears slightly here. Uh, again, we want to provide some examples, a model for people to adopt or adapt as they see fit uh, for their purposes. But if you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech or a lift speech or whatever, whatever the proper tra uh, translation is of that uh, phrase, elevator speech on what you currently do, you know, and this is you at the party, when somebody comes up to you and asks you, so Don, what do you do? So what is your 30 second uh, response to that? I say, I create spaces for people to have useful conversations about learning and performance. And that's it, okay. Now, either at that point, people are interested, they want to know more or they're not, and that's fine. They, you know, we go and talk about the weather or the football or whatever. But if they're interested, then we can go on like and go in more detail, but for me, it's about creating useful conversation. So maybe I'm having a conversation, or maybe other people, two other people are having a conversation. And useful, of course, could mean many things. So it's useful for somebody starting a startup. If I could put them in touch with somebody else who can test their ideas, great. Or it could be a useful conversation with me. I could say to them, for goodness sake, don't go down that route, but that route looks really hopeful. Or it could be a conference where, as I said earlier, I want people to get together and hear something and then get involved in a conversation with each other. For me, it's all about creating the space where people can have those useful, not idiotic, silly conversations, but useful conversations where people are really engaging with something that matters to them and hopefully finding something useful at the end of the talk. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's so, that's so important. And I, and I really like that. That's, you know, this is what uh, we as social beings need is, is others bounce our ideas off to take ideas from other people. And uh, this is all extremely valuable. Let, let me shift gears again here. And as a lifelong learner, what's your current focus or next focus for learning? And, and, so, and are, you, are you writing anything on that that we might expect soon? Or you know, what can you share with us about you as a learner today and what you're focused on? Got a pile of books around me on the desk here, Guy. And rather like you and your background and me and my background, I just I believe that the book is the the, the single most high impact, densest way of conveying information. So the thing I'm really interested in learning at the moment is I'm, I'm reading a lot about startups. So here's a book of here's my pile of books I'm reading <laughs> on startups right now. In fact, that's not all of them. Um, uh, and it's it's a range of things: so how to get acquired, from startup to exit, why startups fail. <laughs> and Margaret O'Mara's The Code, which looks really good. And that's, that's about how, you know, tech bros have dominated Silicon Valley and, and what's, why that may not be a perfectly good thing. Um, the other thing which I'm developing myself on at the moment is, if you like, equity. So um, a couple of books here, Demanding More, and another book about reimagining digital learning for sustainable development. So that's, that's on the side of those two. That sort of forms one complete pile for me. So that's, that's what I'm interested in learning about at the moment. It's not what I don't know about it, but it's dangerous always to assume that you know enough. Certainly, you never know everything, but do you know enough? No, you don't. So you've got to keep learning. Um, and that is a sort of a quasi-formal addition to my informally gathered knowledge that I've collected over the years. In terms of what I'm writing, I'm writing um, uh, another book about challenges for learning and development, it's sort of I would call it meditations, but that sounds rather too great a term. But it's a book that looks at 12 things that we just haven't really pinned down in learning and development. And we really need to think about in more detail. 
started with the fact that nobody can define learning adequately. And that's very convenient because it gives everybody a platform on which to express an opinion. Well, I really don't care. And you know, if somebody says, learning is this, someone says, no, learning is that, it leads to a vacuous lot of hot air, which benefits nobody. I'd much rather we were able to have conversations, perhaps where we disagree, that's fine, but where we disagree about something which we've agreed the definition of in the first place. Anyway, so that's that's a book which I hope to get out in, it will probably be probably 2024, I imagine, uh, that will come out. Um, it just needs a bit of work. But you know what it's like, Guy, with these things. Sometimes in the pursuit of perfection, uh, you never get to the deadline. So I might have to simply say to myself, well, it won't be 12, it'll be eight, but at least I'll get it finished on time. And it's a, it's a the Errol charge. They talks about the, the everything is beta version. So I, I've tried to give up on perfection here because it is the enemy of getting anything done and out the door. So absolutely, some of us tend towards perfectionism, even though we sh we should. Do <laughs> We've never even gotten close. We like to pretend that we are, I guess. Um. So I the, my next question here is about. Uh, uh, our terminology, the language that we use. And I've been asking this question since 2008 of, of the people that I've interviewed for these videos, because language is, our language has always been messy. And when I first got in the field in, in 1979 and in the early 80s, I heard people complaining about this. And I soon realized that, yes, I was struggling because we, we use our, our language is just very messy, very sloppy. And, uh, so I want to give you a chance here to uh, take a term or a phrase and define it for us, either because you feel it's being misused or misconstrued, and you'd like to straighten us all out on that, or you just want to simply put your spin on some term. But, but what would you share with us? Well, I'd come back to this idea about learning. I think learning is a word that is uh, misused. Um, and to an extent, that doesn't matter. And one could always tie oneself to not and get very haughty and self-righteous about, um, oh, I believe it means this. No, I believe it means that. That's, that. That isn't terribly important. But when it starts to influence how we think and influence how we behave in negative ways, and I think it does matter. One of the things that really bugs me about the use of the word learning, regardless of how we define it, is when people say, oh, yeah, well, we're, we're creating learning or we're distributing learning. Um, which absolutely makes no sense. I think you tweeted today, Guy, um, somebody saying, learning is um, an event. No, learning is not an event. And guess what? Both of these can be true. And I really like that. The answer is, I think, as you said, it's more complex or it's usually it depends, which is the perfect answer. For me, learning is a process or a series of process that takes place inside people. And you can try to define what those are and how you can see them in certain ways. But they are things that happen inside people. When we talk about creating and distributing learning for consumption, we're talking about content. If we misconstrue content and call it learning, I think two things happen. Firstly, we are overselling what we do. We're not creating learning. We are creating content, and that's it. Nothing wrong with that, but it's content. Secondly, we are both adding something to ourselves and removing agency from the people we serve. They are the people who learn. Whether it's me standing in front of a classroom trying to tell someone the difference between two and a lot, and there is a difference, or between must and have to, and there is a difference in English, whether I'm trying to get that definition clear to somebody, I'm helping them, I'm supporting them in their learning. I don't create content. I do create content. I don't create learning for them. It's a process inside them. So for me, we are undermining and doing a disservice to the people whose learning we are trying to support when we use learning in that way. I could go on for another half an hour about this, but that's the key area where I feel we are misconstruing the word learning. Personally, I blame uh, Peter Senge and the uh, the fifth discipline and the learning organization for it, it was back in the early to mid 90s that all my clients changed their names from training and development to learning and development or something along those lines here. Yeah, because they were mistaken in thinking that they were the learning organization and not their entire enterprise. But uh, it's, been, it's been an issue and uh, uh, a subject for many, 
but I, but I, but I take what you say here, and I, I agree with you that you know we shortcut it. it we're creating learning content to, to facilitate yes. learning. We're not creating learning, but but that's just one of the issues that I think that uh, you know I, I I wrote a I wrote an article a couple of decades ago about no such thing as communications. It's only miscommunications more or less because we, <laughs> and if we understand that that we really can't communicate 100%, we can't have zero defects, that behooves us to work a little bit harder to make sure that what we've communicated was received appropriately um, and, and that we should all know going into that that uh, we're gonna have to, it's, we're gonna have a lot of false starts on all that. But, uh, but uh, yeah, language is an issue. And I think for new people, you know, the, the bad thing is, is that the marketing efforts in our field cause new terms to be created, old terms to be uh, changed in terms of what they mean. And it makes it confusing for new people coming in. And I think that they need to appreciate the fact that, that they have to be careful about, you know, what, what they consider, what they think about when they hear our language being tossed around. And they should know that there's tremendous variation in how we use it. Uh, and I, I apologize to them in advance for that <laughs> as they climb the learning curve, but that's just one of the things that they're going to have to figure out. And it's only gotten worse in my 40 years in the business. I think you're right. It's a cappuccino. There's a lot of froth on the top, but if you can get underneath it, there's something worthwhile underneath. And I think if you can stick with the stuff under the froth and just remember, yeah, this other stuff's going to come and go. Stay with what matters, which is helping people learn. And the rest of it is either a tool to support that or not. Yeah. So let's go back a little bit uh, to some of the people who, who more recently are influencing you. Now, you are uh, the man about town. Uh, John Helmer claimed that you were the James Bond of uh, learning and development. I thought that was funny. And uh, um, but we won't we don't need to go into why. But um, so but you you are exposed to a lot of people and a lot of people's thinking in the business. So it's kind of unfair to ask you to just single out, you know, a few people here, but, but who would you point our audience to, uh, to individuals or to articles or to books that you think might be helpful to them? So I'd, I'd, I'd go for four things. I'd go for book wise. I'd go for evidence informed learning design by Miriam Nealon with Paul Kirshner. Uh, definitely Julie Dirksen's design for how people learn. In terms of podcasts, I would definitely go to uh, Michelle Ockers in Australia, Learning Uncut, which is a fabulous series of case studies. It's not people in their armchairs waving their arms around. It's people who have actually been out there and done it and what they learn from it. It's an absolutely fabulous podcast. And, of course, John Helmer and Donald Clark on Great Minds. The, the look at the... Uh, the great theorists of learning in the past and how do they string together? How do they relate to each other? So it's a, it's a really good introduction to that. So I think if you're coming into the field or indeed, if you're in the field, those are four great resources to tap into. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. As we begin our wrap up here, uh, first of all, thanks for doing this with me. Uh, but my final question to you is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially those new to the field? related to learning and development and performance improvement. Can I change it to any career advice I'd offer people? Please. There's a term which I think David Snowden uh, introduced me to, which is retrospective coherence. So I'm approaching 60. Um, you kindly refer to me as the man uh, about town, and John Helmer claims I'm uh, licensed to skill as the James Bond of the industry. Uh, it's not entirely a fluke that I got here, but neither was it planned. Retrospectively, everything seems to make sense. Oh, there's a series of steps, and I ended up here. At each time with those steps going forward, there are any one of a number of steps you could take to take you to the next stage. How do you know which one to take? So that's the that's the question which I'd like to answer, if it is part of wisdom or if it's just a, a commonplace idea, which many other people have come up with, I don't know. If I look back at my life, or my career anyway, and actually I actually had this conversation with my father before he died. He said, well, there were two or three points he could look to in his life, which were absolute turning points. But that he was only ready at those turning points 
to take advantage of them because of what had happened beforehand. So if I go back to that point of coming back to the UK from Turkey, I didn't have much money. I was 28. I probably had to get a job. There was a depression in the UK, or at least a recession. And I saw that advert in the paper. Are you reasonably good at everything? And I was only prepared for that moment because up to that point, I had not whimsically followed my passion, which is a lot of people would uh, invite you to do, but rather I'd gone after the things which I thought would be interesting and build out my skills and my knowledge in a particular area that I found exciting at one time, whether it was what we called desktop publishing or it was understanding how to program a computer or understanding how to sell or to market or whatever. These are all things that I found interesting and I wanted to explore and develop myself in. And then when that opportunity became available, I was well suited for it. Fast forward to the end of the 1990s, I went off to do my startup. Yeah, but before that, I was ready to do something completely different in a different field. But then I was sitting at a conference in Hamburg and I looked around a room, there were 300 people sitting there and I thought, why am I going to go off to do that idea where I don't know people, I don't really know what it's about. There is a high risk of failure. And I look across this room here and I know all these people. I have a good reputation with them. I can help them and I can build on that. I'd spent the previous eight years building those relationships to that point. But I went on then to use those. And I don't mean exploit them less badly, but I went on to use those relationships in my subsequent startup. So you get to a certain point and there will be inflection points. There is no certification you can take. There is no course you can take. There is only feeding your insatiable curiosity in, on a wide variety of fronts. And then when you come to a point, choose that door, go through it and start on the next series of adventures. So I would say, if I could boil all that down, you may have a great idea where you want to get to, superb. But if you don't, don't worry. Always be looking for what excites you and where you can keep learning, develop yourself. And that way, wherever you end up, it'll be the right place for you. Very nice, thank you. Again, thanks so much for sharing with us today. Uh, I look forward to uh, following you further as you uh, take your career in the 60s. <clears throat> and you'll never catch up to me, however. But anyway, thank you again so much for this. And uh, I look forward to uh, following you. And I hope this has been uh, helpful to our audience. Thanks. I, I always enjoy following you and I shall do my best to be worthy of you following me and to continue, I hope, to provide value. Cheers. <laughs>